Good to be with you once again here at Midweek Manna as we are in our study of the book of Romans. And we are going to chapter 9. So as you probably have looked ahead, uh, we'll be finishing up Romans before you know it. And um, again, I trust that of, of the studies we've done, which each one are independent of each other and beneficial, maybe this one would, uh, to a percentage of us, would say, I am really glad I went through this particular study because I just really never looked at the uniqueness of this particular letter and how it's still to this very day, <clears throat> you know, 2,000 plus years later, is um, used in our seminaries uh, for a theological basis, a thesis. Um, and of course, for the everyday practicing Christian, um, there are probably as many passages, independent verses that are memorized, known, or at least principled in our life than any other letter of the New Testament. It's just that important. Uh, again, as we talk about this letter that uh, Paul wrote, uh, I, I know that there's always the possibility of somebody else <clears throat> not only presently watching, uh, that's just getting involved in the study, and you'll have the privilege of going back to all the others. But of course, these are archived, and there could be someone a year from now watching and uh, it really speaks to them. So uh, I'm trying my best not to repeat everything we've learned, but foundationally, this was a letter <clears throat> written by Paul to uh, believers in Rome in which Paul himself had never visited. So this is a unique letter in that he uh, wasn't the founder of the church, and uh, it wasn't because of one of his missionary journeys. Um, this one is uh, stellar in the fact that this is a goal for Paul. Now, we, we, we're looking in hindsight. We're looking in a rearview mirror. But for Paul, it's like, man, if I can just get to Rome, uh, we can share the good news of the gospel. Um, again, Paul was this very unique vessel in that um, he had a double heartbeat in the respect that he was a Jew, uh, as we're going to find out, especially in chapter 9, how much he dearly loved his nation, his people group. And when you say nation, that means people group, more than just using the word country, giving parameters. Um, he, he loved the Jewish people. He had to contend with the Jewish people. His anguish came from the Jewish people, um, some from a very zealot uh, religious position that um, you're desecrating the law, and we're, that's going to show up in chapter 9. Um, <clears throat> but also he had those who just uh, uh, wanted to know why he was a turncoat. Here he had persecuted the church of Jesus Christ, and now he's becoming this front runner of, of the purposes of it. So, I mean, he was, um, um, uh, he had a checkered past, right? Um, he was an enigma. So, uh, we, we see him now back to this letter. He's, uh, I want to get to Rome. Uh, from Rome, we can take the world to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So I've shared enough foundationally, especially for those of you that may have just be joining this study or, again, a future date from now. So I want you to turn with me to chapter 9, and I'd like to read the first six verses. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow an unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. 
To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all. Blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. So, what we see here, again, is this uh, double heartbeat. So, I mentioned uh, just momentarily ago the, the love for his kinsmen, his, uh, the Jews. But he also is this, as we see it now, the ramrod, the beginning of the work um, to the Gentile world, the rest of the world. Because really, the whole world was divided in two categories, the Jewish community and everybody else. And, uh, and we still see that to this day, don't we? Uh, it is not uncommon in whatever congregation you worship God in to say, I was raised Baptist, but now I'm in a Pentecostal church. I was raised Pentecostal, but now I'm uh, in a Presbyterian church. And, you know, we all feel like, well, most people gravitated to us. But when you sit back and look, they're because of marriages, because of experiences and how they experienced, because of connections with certain believers, <clears throat> we transition. And, and, and for the most part, we're okay with that uh, because, hey, we're, we're Christians. And yet, then there's the Jews. Well, we know in our world and at Grace Life, we have Messianic Jews, those who recognize, like Paul, that they have Jewish ancestry, and yet Jesus Christ uh, is not an enemy. He's the Savior of the world. So we see here this, um, this, this, this failure, uh, this tragic failure. Uh, and so as Paul is writing, uh, again, preceding, I'm, I'm speaking for the most part to, to Jews. I'm, I'm not to Rome yet, and we want to reach the Gentiles there as well. But I'm writing to the Jewish community because the day of Pentecost has already happened, and there were delegates there were, you know, uh, men that had traveled in their pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the feast. And, of course, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, they've experienced that. And they're now going back to Rome like every other community. Because remember, we, we got to remember the wonderful day of the day of Pentecost. And everybody said, we heard the marvelous news, the good news in our own tongue, uh, our own dialect. And that was part of the miracle of the day. So these believers, uh, uh, many of them uh, Jews who became believers in Jesus Christ because of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, are back there, and Paul's writing to them. So he's not trying to manipulate. However, he wants them to hear his heart because, again, if he just starts going in and blasting, well, you know, you guys have rejected Jesus. Well, we're just going to throw this letter away. He's letting them know his heart. And he's letting them know uh, that he's not writing from a position of condemnation. That, that is huge, and we, we need to make sure we understand that. He's not, again, just condemning them for their uh, epic failure. He is uh, speaking to them with contrition. He's speaking to them with a broken heart. Um, so Paul states that um, uh, he would have laid down his life for them, for the sake of Jesus Christ. In other words, if me laying down my mortal life would be the one instrument, the one event that would cause all of you to understand that Jesus Christ is the very Son of God, um, he would have done it. So what a, what a commitment, what a statement uh, as he's writing to them. Um, so we understand again, and I want to use a, 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 an example from Exodus chapter 32, verse 32, as it is Moses uh, who now has gone up to the mountain, to Sinai. He, uh, he has received the Ten Commandments. 
And as he comes back down from the mountain, uh, already his ears had picked up on the the sound that was not a worshipful sound. It was a, a sensual sound. It was a partying sound. And now that he got in view so that he could optically see what's going on, I mean, he is watching the seductive dance um, uh, but it, it isn't worship unto God. It is worship unto a, a graven image, this golden calf. So they've taken what God had blessed them with out of Israel. Uh, and of all of the spoils, part of it was, of course, gold and silver. And, you know, they had earrings and, and amulets and necklaces, and they melt it down and create this golden calf. Now you gotta remember, uh, just just a side note here, but but why it's even more pivotal. When by the time they are in the wilderness and creating the tabernacle, they already had the building materials from Egypt. Remember the holy place, the holy of holies. Remember. Uh, the, the, the caps over all the posts out in the courtyard that were silver. Where did they get that stuff? They didn't go to Home Depot or Gold Depot or Silver Depot. They uh, didn't go to Lowe's. They already had it with them from spoils of the land. So here, some of it is now what God knew he would call upon them to honor and worship him. They were worshiping something else. And so God is, in, in today's vernacular, ticked, and he's ready to wipe them out. He'll raise up another people, and it is Moses that comes up. He doesn't condone, he doesn't defend, but he lays his life on the line, and God spares national Israel. Now, he judges them, but he doesn't wipe them out because uh, Moses says, then Blot me out as well. Take my name out of the book. Wow. And this is the kind of spirit in which Paul is writing again to Israel, to the Jews, to this nation. Uh, and he, he's showing them. And, and now the thing that if we don't get anything else out of today's study, if you've never had this thought, if you've never had this understanding, if you've never had this appreciation, then you have dialed into the right station. I'll read it first, and then we'll just give a little more commentary. When he says, verse 4, as we know it today, they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. You need to underscore that in your Bibles or your digital Bible, underscore it. We need to know to this day, again, see how important this letter is. It wasn't just to a people he's never been to yet. It's, it's speaking to us. And we need to be reminded, especially as Gentiles, that God awarded this responsibility to this people. We know of the other scriptures that support that, that Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. So, uh, and we could give other scriptures, but the point we're trying to bring out is here they have gone astray, but Paul is still not writing from a, from a position of condemnation or gloating. He's writing to say, because of the Israelites and the, the exception, the, uh, how exceptionally they, uh, they are seen in the eyes of God, look what has been given to them. From them comes the worship. Today we talk about the tabernacle of David uh, being reinstated upon the earth. And as Pentecostals, my goodness, we love our worship, don't we? We trust its worship unto God. 
And, and, and it comes from this inheritance that came through this people. If this people had been blotted out, it all would have been lost. So to them, it was given the law. To them was given the patriarchs. When, when we look at our Bibles, we look at the 66 books, as we call it. How many Gentile writers do we have? Very, very, very few. As a whole, most authors are Jewish. The book itself. Uh, and without just going in, in, in real detail, let me put it this way. God appointed the Jews to be the custodians of the law. And because of their nature, uh, as, as Jesus, of course, would have to deal with them and call them stiff-necked and whatever. Well, again, to this day, Judaism is very strict. The Hasidic Jews, especially Orthodox Jews. I mean, there's all kinds of flavors of Jews, just like there's all flavors of Gentiles. So, However, we have what we have today because of that relationship. Now, by the time we get to chapter 11, it's really going to speak to us. But right now, this very, very, very important chapter to us today, understanding Paul uh, is not condemning them. And, and let me say this, and I'll repeat it again as we get to the next couple of chapters. Many of us have been, if we've been raised in Christian homes, Christian churches, um, or uh, uh, under... Um, influence of somebody that uh, didn't know they were passing it all. Many of us have come under the influence of replacement theology, which means that Jesus came to his own and they didn't receive him. So poof, we're done with them. And now the Gentile church has taken the place of Israel and we've become the new Israel in God's heart and he's moved past them. That's called replacement theology. And as much as God raised them up and had to discipline them and judge them, rebuke them, and at times taking a position, I'm going to wipe them out. Because of them, we have what we have because of their nature. <clears throat> they were sticklers. I mean, when you talk about the law being passed down, if you want to Google it and study it yourself, the, the minute, the minuscule, the deliberate, the intentional, the painstaking efforts that the scribes went through, they didn't have printing presses. They didn't have Internet. To write it, that's why the Qumran Dead Sea Scrolls are so important of a find in archaeology. To pass this on without disruption, that responsibility was given to the Jews. And because they were faithful to it, we still have what we have today. Are there translation errors, to, er, uh, errors today? Yeah. And maybe we'll, we'll deal with that more in detail later on. But the point he's bringing out, because we got to move on to, in today's study, is to understand these covenants that God would have for the earth. For example, uh, and mentioned, he, he mentions covenants, plural. So you think about the Adamic covenant. Well, it was broken with Adam. Then we talk about the Noadic or the covenant with Noah. The planet is still here with human beings on it because not of Noah's sons and his daughter-in-laws nor his wife. It was a covenant with Noah. We think of now the major covenant that heavily affects us to this day, the covenant of the law being given to national Israel there in Sinai. Because of that covenant, we still live under that covenant. And that's why, again, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is so important. It was given on the same day, of course, 3,000 years later, uh, as the giving of the law. And you got to remember, because of the abuse, you ever done the math? 
3,000 perished in the wilderness because of the sacrilege. But at Pentecost, with the outpouring, as Peter preaches under this new anointing, how, how many converts? 3,000. You see the replacement? Oh, my. I'd like to camp out there. But then he mentions one more thing, and, and I've taken more in these first six verses than the time, and then I will the rest of this. And it's all good. But he also, one more time I'll read it, verse 4, They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race according to the flesh is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. So again, to them was given Jesus. He was a Jew. All right, born of a Jewish virgin mother. Let's go on now. I want to read verses 7 through 13. And not all are children of Abraham. He's talking about the descendants. So let me go back to verse 6 so we're not lost. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. So again, he, he's moving on. God's purposes are higher than man's failure. Not all who are descended from Israel, belong to Israel. So what does that mean? Now, verse 7. And not all are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring. But, be, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Whew, thank you, Jesus. Verse 9. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election, there's a big word, might continue not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was old, excuse me, she was old, but she was told. <laughs> the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So again, uh, we're really getting into the nitty gritty of what that first century group was hearing. And that is, well, we're Jews. We're just blessed. Uh, we're beyond failure. Uh, God, we're God's people. He owes us. He gave us this responsibility. It's a heavy responsibility. We have the holy law. We have these commandments, not suggestions. Um, and now, of course, to to honor him, we've added to it and just got it to minute detail. And now we've got 613 different commandments. And, of course, nobody could live it. But they wanted to hold on to the fact that we're Jews. And so we're finding out about the choices of God. And so what does it mean? Well, they're in Israel, but they're not Israelites. Um, you know, they're Jews, but they're... What does that mean? They're, they, they, of the flesh... Being descendants, we've gone to Ancestry.com, and we've got uh, uh, the blue blood in us. We've got the DNA. But are they children of the promise? And so then you get into this big, 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 big word, election. And this is where it messes with our head. And this is where we struggle. And we're we're, we're going to say it here, but we're going to reinforce it a couple more times. So he takes the time to talk about Abraham and Sarah. And he takes the time to show us that, that both the boys from Abraham's bloodline are given life, Ishmael and Isaac, one born of a bondwoman, Hagar, and one born of to the wife of promise, Sarah, or Sarai at the time. 
And we see that uh, both the boys, probably 13 years difference, something like that, uh, they're both of Abraham's seed, right? So they have the bloodline. They have the DNA. But that's not good enough. By God's election, Isaac was the child of promise. Then he goes on in their ancestry and speaks about it again. And before that, we, we need to understand, or I mean after that, excuse me, uh, you have Abraham, then you have the result of that, Isaac. And now he has a wife, and her name's Rebecca. And now in her womb, oh, I'm feeling kicking on the side, kicking on the side. Oh, there's two heartbeats. Oh, we got twins. And even though they are of the seed of Abraham, coming now through Isaac, they're both in the same womb. And we know that, that uh, Esau comes out first. The prophecy goes forth that the elder shall serve the younger. And later, and, and right here, can you imagine hearing these words that says that God loved Jacob? And Jacob is who? He becomes Israel. So God loves Israel, and he hates Esau. So we go back again to Abraham. He has Ishmael, and Ishmael becomes the father of who? The Arabs. Isaac uh, becomes the child of promise, and his descendants are who? The Jews. Again, Jews come from the tribe of Judah, and they all got labeled Jews eventually. Then you get into the next generation, and you have Esau and Jacob. And it is from Esau that you have the Edomites. And then, of course, we, we know again uh, who Jacob is. So we, we know that you've got uh, these bloodlines working, and he's speaking to them. And he's telling them God has an election process. Um, this process of election uh, is, 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 again, hard for us because it sounds like God just arbitrarily, you know, selects. But let's go on as we're going to read verses 14 through, uh, through 18. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God, who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for the, man, this, this is huge. He says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever, whoever he wills. Is your head hurting yet? I mean, wow, God, is that deliberate? He has an election process. He selects through that election. I mean, there is story after story. David was in the line of election. As Samuel's going to that household, the, the, the next king's coming out of this household. But we see the selection through the election process that, well, it, we know it's going to be. It's, it's firstborn. No, really? Well, maybe it's the tallest. No. Well, maybe it's the strongest. No. Maybe it's the... Well, I've... You're out of sons. I know what God is saying here. Do you have any more sons? Oh, yeah, I got the, got the baby boy out there tending to the sheep. Well, bring him in here. <laughs> there he is. That's the selection of the election. I think that's one of the best 
pictures that we have through Scripture of, uh, of this process with God. So uh, Exodus chapters 9 through 16, obviously I'm not going to read all that right now, but we see that, that Egypt's role, Pharaoh's role, served a purpose, a higher purpose, to speak to the whole world of the power of God. So to this day, um, you know, we, we struggle with things. Now, I haven't done it in a while, but one of the gifts that I, th I feel like the Holy Spirit gave me for this church was E to the fifth power, that we can experience God, that we can have encounter with God. We know that uh, in God, he equips us. Uh, we know that uh, uh, he's engaging in us. And so in these things that uh, God is moving in our midst uh, and, and establishing us, he still selects. I mean, we go back to um, parable of talents and, and uh, this is good, and, and I, I'm, I'm watching my time, but I'm going to give Eric Helms credit for this. And of course, he grew up in this church, and he's pastoring now in Cartersville. Uh, his mother and sister, Barbara and Melinda, are here. And I had some time with him the other day, and as we're talking, we're talking about the parable of the talents. And, and we always talk about to one was given five, one, two, one, one. Well, typically, when we go through that study, we talk about the one who got five because he was given the most. Why was he given it? Well, he produced with it. And how much did he produce? Another five. And then we know that we bypass the middle one, typically. It's just kind of a, a side note. And we get to the one that was given one. And what did the one do with the one? He buried it. And so when the master came back, the one who received five and produced five is pl uh, God's pleased, the master's pleased. And then we get to the one who buried it. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, of course, it's judged accordingly. If you'd have just put it in the bank and earned 1% interest, you know, it would have been something. But what Eric was bringing out is we, again, the one who didn't do anything with the one, that was still on the table. Who, who got it to the one that did the most with it? So, was well, that fair? Why don't you just give it to the guy and be a little more, you know, fair in this process? Well, we struggle with stuff like that. So what Eric was bringing out is, what about those of us that have received the two talents? We're, we're not known for the major things that this guy just keeps getting recognized for, this lady gets recognized for, and, and obviously are talented and, and get the job done. And we're, we're not this guy that is derelict of his duties. I feel like a nobody. I feel like I'm in no man's land. I just feel like I'm, I'm in between these things. Many of us feel that way. Well, again, God is at work. Will he one day justify all this? And, and before we leave this earth, oh, well, this has been the real hidden jewel and we're all going to give him an attaboy. A lot of times it isn't seen that way. So God is at work in his elections, in his selections. Again, we're afraid of these words of predestination, predestined. He foreknew us. And in that, he called us and he's glorified us. So, uh, again, we see uh, these things, and we just have to ask the question, well, where is the justice of God? Where's the fairness of God? So let's go on, verses 19 through 29. You will say uh, to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, old man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to the molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, for which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles? Oh, big question. 
Again, remember who Paul's writing to. As indeed, he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people, and her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. So again, we're seeing this uh, uh, very humbling statement um, of, of, of the clay with the potter. And so we got to ask ourselves, have we ever fussed at God? God, why, why, why am I going through this? Have we ever boohooed on his shoulder? Have we ever just like, okay, I, I need to get away. I need, I need to really get my mind wrapped around this. You still can't get your mind wrapped around it. God, why, why would you promote that person? Why did pastor pick that person? Why is that person, oh, so hard to get along with, but so talented. And just the, the questions go on and on and on and on. And he reminds us, isn't the potter the one who has power of the clay? What clay vessel can say, hey, 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 no, uh, uh, I want a bigger handle on the side of me if I'm going to be a pitcher uh, for life. You know, I, I don't like this little spout. I want a bigger spout. And yet that's exactly what we feel and many times express as we look at somebody else. As Zig Ziglar said, the unfair comparisons, we choose somebody's uh, best attribute and compare it to our weakest and say, yeah, look, and we, we really aren't very good at that game. Uh, so again, we're seeing that God is intentional. We just can't always understand him. There are some questions that will never get answered in this life. Why did I go through that? Why that marked me for life? And 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 then you hear this wording of, of he does things ahead of time. And and then you take a Hosea who remember who Hosea is, he marries a woman, who is of whoredoms. And maybe it wasn't a weird name back then, but we've all grown up. And at least we got reruns of black and white Gomer Pyle <laughs> to, to marry a woman with the name of Gomer. It's like wow, insult to injury, right? And, but he did that as an example to a whole nation. Hey, and so it's leading up to a crescendo here. Hosea says, God is going to take a people that aren't his people and make him his people. So let's go on as we conclude. We look at verses 30 through 33. So what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching the law, that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as if it were based on works, they have stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Of course, speaking of Jesus himself. So as we conclude this study, you know, it comes to this crescendo. And basically what you have is a Jewish line of thinking, a way of living, a way of expressing, and you've got the Gentile way. Immediately, national Israel says, well, this is a no-brainer. You know, it's the tortoise and hare again, right? You know, we're the hare. <laughs> we got this. It's a cinch, not a problem. To us was given the glory, remember? To us was given 
the law. And we have fulfilled that, every painstaking effort of it. To us was given the tabernacle, given us the instruments of worship. To us was given the patriarchs. Oh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Israel. Yes, and all these things given to us. And then there's the Gentiles, the farm league. Yeah, well, you know, what have they done? Johnny come lately. And what are you bringing to the table? Faith? And you see the difference that Paul was bringing out. Now, again, did he already have some foreknowledge that he'd already heard some rumblings coming out of Rome after the day of Pentecost and knowing that the message was going to all the world? Again, remember, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Joel was the prophet expressing that about an outpouring that would cover the earth. You and I are benefits of benefactors of it today. But for that just happening, maybe there was already some rumblings coming out of Rome. Well, yes, that outpouring was great, and we're just going to keep it to ourselves here. And he's saying, wait a minute, just because you were born a Jew and ha have the DNA all those things doesn't mean you're really the Israelites of promise. And so what it came down to is simply this, that the Jew intended to put God in the position of debt. You owe us. We did all this in your name. Mm. Doesn't it remind you of a New Testament passage as well that Jesus taught? Lord, didn't we do all these things in your name? And he would come back, depart from me, I never knew you. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. We got the DNA, I never knew you. This is exactly what he's saying about just because they were born Jews in Israel wasn't enough. They had to recognize Jesus, the stumbling block, who becomes the rock of our salvation. So to the Jews that were not enlightened, we're going to receive righteousness through our effort, and God's going to owe us. God's indebted to us. That was the Jewish way. The Gentile way was to be content. To be content to be in God's debt. See the difference? To come, whether you're Jew or Gentile, to realize I'm lost and I can't find myself. I've sinned and I can't cleanse myself. I'm broken and I can't fix myself. Jesus, my faith is in you. Yes, I, I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you are the Messiah, the Christos, the Christ, the Savior of the world. And through you, I'm born again through you. I've received salvation through you. You give me your righteousness through you. I am healed. I am made whole through you. I'm promised eternal life. Yes, Jesus. Would you pray with me? Lord, we know today we've done enough study to realize that what we have before us wasn't written that way with chapter and verse all broke down helping us to be able to study and to retain. And yet, by taking this segment known as chapter 9 of the letter of the book to the Roman, you've reminded us a principle that even though we're Gentile and we can say the name of Jesus doesn't mean that he's in our heart. Just because we were born into a Christian nation at the time or a God-fearing home, raised in a great, renowned congregation known as a church. Maybe we played softball on their teams and, and was the home run hitter or the best singer in the choir or the uh, exceptional teacher. It is still about faith. Today, we recognize by faith, Jesus, that it's not our effort we can't be good enough. We can't be smart enough. We can't be educated enough. We can't have the DNA bloodlines. That's all those fall short of the glory of God. 
But Jesus, we recognize you, our Savior and our Lord, and we give you thanks in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed today's study. Until next time, be blessed.